So, um, yeah, this uh, talk is basically uh, based on on um, on yeah a longer thing that I'm that I'm writing right now, and uh, this is also an adapted version for uh, bootcamp coding bootcamp uh, people uh, like you. So basically, I want to um, uh, explain a little bit the aspects that are uh, non-technical uh, about the whole um, yeah. Uh, programming career, let's say. I do have a, a formal uh, computer science background, so I studied and uh, then worked as a software engineer and now I run a small uh, tech uh, recruitment consultancy. Uh, so basically, I actually uh, didn't learn any, like I didn't do much coding during studies, but only then uh, during during the job. and. Um, uh, Regarding hiring and careers, I would say I have like an, an overview from all the sides. So basically, um, uh, this might be interesting for you to see, okay, um, how is this really, uh, uh, let's say, the whole recruitment or career market uh, for you as a beginner and later if you're like um, a little bit more progressed in your career. I hope that you can uh, take away something for like now and for like next month and for like next year, but also something for like 10 years down the line. Should you stay in programming? What all everybody hopes, I, I, I think. So basically, um, if I remember my time, like coding as an employee, like um, uh, yeah, the employee thing. Like so some people like it, some people don't. But I really love the like actual real programming part of, of this uh, because you have a deterministic machine that you fight against all the time. So unlike sales or recruitment or like business uh, work, yeah. Uh, where you have always to deal with people and always a non-deterministic part, actually programming, you uh, do have, like of course, different bugs and different uh, exceptions and so on. But at the end of the day, um, it is something where, like in the gym, you have like a certain weight and kind of it's depending on you whether you can lift it or not. And programming has the same property. So it's extremely pleasant and most people... Um, uh, I think um, uh, get uh, yeah a happiness out of that. Same as uh, book authors or artists or uh, craftsmen like carpenters. They have a very deterministic um, let's say task, and this is generally considered to be very pleasant. Uh, but com compared to like carpenting, actually programming has also a very high monetary aspect. So your you, the stress to responsibility to salary ratio is probably the best from all jobs that I encountered. And uh, the prestige, let's say, is also growing. So, like, let's say, 20 years ago, uh, it was like this: oh, the doctor or uh, yeah, lawyer has the highest prestige. But nowadays, all the extremely rich people in the world they have a programming background, <laughs> and uh, that is why. And uh, yeah, uh, that is why like programming actually becomes like the, like a really prestigious career. So you did a great choice um, going into this boot camp and kickstarting, let's say, your, your technical um, skills with this. Generally, what you learn as a programmer, be it in this boot camp or generally in a long five-year uh, computer science bachelor master program, is uh, you learn general concepts. So what happens if you type something in Google? Like uh, what happens on the network layer, on the backend, on the frontend layer. Um, in a university, you would learn additionally. Okay, what is the Turing machine uh, concept? What, what is the von Neumann architecture? Like the mathematical models that are even behind this. So this is all useful knowledge that you will you, that you will um, need in the back of your of, of your head. More practical things that you usually learn is uh, syntax of a programming language or tricks how to tell actually the computer what to do. So if else uh, for loops uh, may produce in functional uh, languages and, and those are of course important as well. Um, uh, a bit more higher level and uh, harder actually maybe even to get is like discipline, like to really code properly, to give the variables good names, to have uh, correct <coughs> abstractions, so not to have business logic somewhere in the UI if you don't need it. And those things you learn only like with uh, like yeah practice uh, after the bootcamp or during the bootcamp. Uh, additionally, I would even say, um, and then like, let's say the most senior level is that you learn like um, things regarding trends and quality of software. So the difference between like uh, let's say uh, software that runs and good software that is really well written and uh, easy to extend, maintain, test, and uh, yeah reuse yeah. So um, those things uh, generally 
um, can be also viewed in uh, this uh, T-shaped uh, model of, of your skill set. So, um, and most uh, yeah, job vacancies out there, they require um, something like this. So that you, let's say a front-end developer, it would be somebody who really is deep in the front-end. So this would be like the, the, this part of the T, the vertical part. And, uh, but still, a front-end developer nowadays needs some um, yeah, back-end skills, DevOps skills. And um, if you, um, um, at the bootcamp, I think you get a very good general overview. So you learn uh, DevOps, Docker, back-end, front-end. Uh, but maybe already now, like I think you're half, half past half the bootcamp, something like that. Uh, you uh, maybe developed already now, like okay, I like backend or I like frontend better. Um, nowadays, I would even extend this uh, uh, pattern and say there is even like a profile of programmer where you need two vertical things. For example, a classical thing would be some backend developer that has also strong DevOps skills. And this would be like a rounded profile that is very sought after in the market. If you lack one of those things, for example, if you lack the uh, T thing, then like it would be, oh, this person is too general. You cannot really give the person tasks immediately. And if you don't have the breath uh, and you only know like one technical thing, uh, uh, then um, this a classical thing for this only <coughs> vertical person would be like a SAP developer or a Salesforce developer who really knows some pro really proprietary stack like super well and nothing else. So it's like just different profiles, but for you, pers for you, the general market demand for such a profile is probably highest. Um, front end um, is let's say the most liquid market, so that means you have many jobs, many people uh, changing jobs more frequently. Uh, companies need less onboarding because uh, let's say React is or Redux is very similar between companies. Um, so for you as a bootcamp graduate, this might be like one good uh, like path. Um, backend has a little bit this reputation. Uh, yeah, it's more rigorous and for this you really need like computer science master and so on. Um, I think uh, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, was true like maybe five years ago when front-end was really like, yeah, hacking uh, jQuery and most front-end work was actually quite, quite messy. But in the last five years with Angular and React, you do have really structure, um, structured programming on the front end. This reflects also in the salaries. So generally the salaries between those two profiles are already the same. But still there is the stigma that like, yeah, the backend people there know like algorithms and stuff. So um, yeah, that's why also the interview questions tend to be a little bit uh, different sometimes. But this talk is actually about what you typically don't learn uh, um, as a programmer. So all the things that people tend to forget because um, uh, yeah, career and job hunting is something you focus only every three years maybe on. And um, uh, let's jump uh, into it. So um, uh, regarding interviewing, basically uh, every company has a very uh, similar process. You have a phone screen with someone, you have a coding task, you have an on-site where you meet the company in person, and then you have some sort of salary negotiation. And at each stage of this, uh, things can go wrong. Um, uh, where the fault is, uh, where like it's the programmer's fault, or it's the company's fault, or there's no like it's nobody's fault. Just things like really um, uh, get uh, completely chaotic, and uh, something doesn't fit, and then nothing happens. Um, I have um, written a long article about this, about the most let's say weird uh, stories. Uh, one is, for example, the candidate handed in like a homework task and then one of the people who looked at, the, at it said, oh, this is like a very bad framework, nobody should use it, so reject. So uh, looking at, he didn't, so the, the other parameters of the developer were not looked at, it was just this and then the rejection decision. And the candidate didn't know like, okay, oh, he should maybe like oh, th think uh, what to use here. So this was a very, let's say, painful situation. Then I had a situation where somebody from like a very strong background, so it was clearly somebody who could like really program really well, and he did really well in the whole interview process. So he went until the onsite and impressed everybody. Uh, only one person was not happy with this engineer uh, because this person asked in a like interview, "Hey, uh, what is the like? Can you describe the Bayesian formula?" So this is this uh, probability of A uh, under the condition of B equals to like B 
like the reverse divided by the probability of that. So this formula is quite famous, but this programmer didn't know it. So he gave his uh, uh, veto right. So in the hiring committee, it was like a veto. Okay, now we will not hire this person because of only this. And this was literally a discussion then in the round of like 10 people. Uh, at the end of the day, luckily they decided to that this person doesn't get his veto. And then um, they hired the person and he was like the best engineer in the company for the next like four years or so. But this was this last uh, one small thing that didn't fit. And, um, so because, look, um, companies look for programmers, that's true. And everybody like in the news and so on, like, oh, we look for programmers and so on. But still you have those situations and actually quite often. Because at the end of the day, the, the company really also doesn't want to hire like a like wrong fit. And in their imagination, this means different things. Yeah? Um, then I had a funny story where I was quite, uh, at the end of the, the process, it was very weird that the interviewer kind of, it, uh, we had the feeling it was clearly that kind of the candidate was really strong and you could replace actually the one who was interviewing and then somehow it didn't work out and uh, like that was most probably the main reason. Uh, one last story was a little, uh, was uh, the situation that was uh, completely random so basically there was like a on-site interview and everything went fine but then like uh, like i went on vacation the hr and then the company didn't answer the person and the person didn't answer the company and so everybody was thinking like uh, the other party rejected so then four weeks later when then somebody discovered that actually there was nothing happening uh, we like figured it out oh like that people are waiting for, for a decision so no it was nobody's fault but still things got really, really like in a, in, in, in a bad, in, in a bad direction. And I have many more stories, uh, but uh, like uh, this is for you to show that there is like many things that go wrong and people, like one of the reasons is that people have like a wrong mental model about like interviewing and careers. So I wrote down like, like a, maybe a small list of those. So, um, um, the, the, most of the applicants, they think, oh, I don't have a CS degree, it's very bad, and um, people want to hire people uh, with uh, computer science degrees because like, they know programming because they studied it. And this is really not true. So because behind closed doors, some companies will tell you like extremely straight out, we want to have somebody with a degree just because they show they can finish stuff and really listen to like, in, like like to 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 things they are told to do like literally this is what what they say of course it's not appears in the PR page but this is one of the main reasons for let's say the value of a university degree and you people now are here to really finish finish this boot camp and this will also carry some kind of signal that you like were able to like intensively sit here like for twelve hours a day for many many weeks so um, then people have a misconception about general uh, the duration of an interview process. So um, uh, people like uh, send an email with their CV and then they don't get a reply for like a week and then they think it's a no. And generally in business, if there is like not a reply with a no, like it doesn't mean no. It does only mean that there is like chaos because like almost everywhere it's like it's like a chaotic situation. But I have it a lot, especially from programmers, they don't get a reply, then they think it's like they don't want to continue the process with you. But this is not the case. So if you don't get a reply, it's normal to, 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 to let's say, resend a reminder within three days, within five days. I had once a situation with like a business person, I wanted to like, uh, we wanted to, to do a thing together um, uh, regarding recruitment, of course. And then the person in person, uh, in person in a meeting told me, hey, okay, email me this and like we'll follow up. And this was a very busy CEO and I had really uh, sent him then 14 follow-up emails with like, hey, uh, you said we will do something. Let's like schedule some meeting. And then literally it took 14 emails until this person answered, hey, I had a super important project. Uh, thank you that you followed up. Like, let's do something. Um, of course, uh, if a person replies like, no, I don't want to do that, like, that's, then of course it means no. But just to show you from like business practice, it can take up to like 14 follow-ups um, to get an actual yes or no, because no is fine, because then you can focus on other things. Uh, but it is important to get like an explicit answer. Um, then people have a misconception about screening. So basically you invest like some weeks in your CV and your GitHub and your project portfolio, 
And then you think the recruiter will like open your profile and then invest like 20 minutes in looking into this. But this is not true. Like even for like if you hire for a senior role, usually there is a huge lack of time because recruiters and business people, they wake up every morning and they have literally 200 emails in their inbox. This is the reality for most business people. 200 emails every day, things you have to like finish or new emails. That is a huge workload. So basically what has to happen is to give the uh, interviewer like a quick way to assess your profile. And uh, an example I have in another workshop that's like the YouTube link, uh, but the gist of the workshop is that you should like have your CV in a way where you say, okay, I did like this and then um, I helped the company reduce uh, like the number of uh, yeah, round trip time from like 200 to 20 milliseconds by ad adjusting the backend. So, so, so like really like bullet point like um, description of what you did. Uh, bad CV and improved CV. So on the left hand side, an example of a bad CV because like I look at it, I have only like five seconds. I don't see, okay, 2015 at the top. I don't know if this is like uh, the person started here like in January or December. It's a big difference because it's like one year more, right? And then, okay, what did the person do? Like some uh, large scale, okay, what's that? Like, is it like a uh, uh, thousand users or a million users? I don't know. And then it's like powered by PIM and ERP. I don't know this abbreviations, corporate clients. I don't know if it's like, like uh, you know, uh, bit like really Nestle corporate clients or like medium sized. So it's very, for me now, like a, a lot of work done in the call to find out what the person really did. Uh, whereas after we improved the CV, it's like, Okay, we can see immediately this person worked for two years somewhere, uh, the technology was clearly uh, Python, and then this person uh, worked um, in, in, uh, yeah, in the continuous integration part, so some DevOps involved for sure. It was like a f uh, this, um, small uh, yeah, e-commerce, um, let's say, uh, business area, and um, he... Oh, oh, no. At the end of the day, so this is maybe like this, which will caught, 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 catch my eye. Is like okay, it's in some backend thing. He reduced like some round trip time, and if I have a call with the person, I will like immediately be able to start like talking about this very specific technical thing, which is what I like to do. Like I don't like to do like really long, um, like thing until we get to the point. Because again, remember you have two hundred like males, and um, unfortunately, actually, what happens is you have those. Because like the internet made, let's say, recruiting easier because you kind of have like all the jobs online and so on. But it also like at the same time, it increased also the volume. So basically, 20 years ago we didn't have internet, nothing. It was like you know five applicants or so. Now it's like 200. So basically, you kind of yeah you get easier to like the jobs and kind of the people. But then the spam is also higher. So we are like where we have been 20 years ago, basically from the efficiency, basically in recruiting because of like more spam. And what happens in in, 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 in practice is if you have 200 emails, then actually you read the email that I got like from a friend or like from somebody that I know, and this is like really bad actually because then you end up with other problems uh, because you, you actually you want to hire like the best person, but then you have only limited time to go through the through the inbound applicants. Same for the GitHub. Also, five seconds should be enough. I immediately look, oh, okay, Python, JavaScript, somehow full stack, something developer. Because it would talk to take a lot of, because some people think, okay, yeah, I will now go to the repositories and then like three folders down to some Python file. Nobody will do this. Because um, if you want to, like, that somebody looks at a Python function or so, you should just link to it. Like, um, and then really tell the interviewer why somebody should actually look at this, at this, at this function. But the problem with GitHub, um, people think it's like a very important thing to find jobs, is that it's somewhat true, but actually also not true. Because it's not clear from a GitHub profile how much you did yourself. Like, how much help you got, how much time you invested, is it really your code, did somebody else do it? So it's kind of like in a way uh, actually igno like a little bit ignored, uh, unless it's just for like generals to see oh, which, let's say, projects you kind of are interested in. Unfortunately, a five seconds uh, thing uh, in, in reality. <laughs> That's the situation, unfortunately, on the market. Then if you go to the phone call, 
uh, what um, uh, happens is uh, that often the interviewer would ask something like about tell uh, us about yourself and if you have prepared yourself well then you like know the interviewer like his profile and the company's profile and like kind of everything which is needed for the job because you read the job description and so on but um, uh, a, a amazing amount of a number of candidates they will actually answer this question with something like this so <laughs> that, then it's kind of like you then have to really like like really go to the actual important thing and obviously this is this is uh, like just um, it's, it's not ideal yeah so there's this pattern situation task action result so you just tell let's let's say um, if you're asked uh, what did you do like in your most complicated project this is a question I like to ask for example then you describe exactly the situation then what was needed to be done and then what you did and how you helped the company uh, or, or like um, the situation to like improve yeah so this is then the result so there's like a pattern that you can really practice and you should practice it so um, if you are rejected which can happen for sure because it's just like interviewing is very messy then of course you can reapply later on uh, because it's not like dating where it's like forever uh, like not possible anymore <laughs> but if you like <laughs> reapply like three six months later then you need to like focus um, on okay what was the reason for rejection and how did you improve? And companies uh, tend to actually not give reasons anymore uh, because like, um, yeah, as a company that costs time, uh, you can be sued, so many reasons. So what happens is like if you have the like applicant system, you just like, okay, they were all not so good, so you checkbox, 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 and then reject. And then everybody gets the email, which is like, unfortunately, due to your great, uh, 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 although you have great qualifications at this very moment, you were not a, a right fit for this uh, position. And it's not a person writing this email because people think that, but it's actually auto like yeah, it looks uh, not automated, but it's automated. So you can follow up and ask the person, hey, I want to really improve, and then uh, the person will maybe take the time to, to to tell you the exact reasons. Maybe on the phone because the person doesn't want to write it because yeah, one of one out of thousand applicants, they just sue the company or try to sue it or something like that. And then, of course, um, yeah, uh, you kind of don't get this benefit of getting real feedback, but you should try to get it, um, uh, yeah, uh, at least try. Yeah? And um, I repeat this point many times because I really want to stress it that uh, recruitment, um, it appears to be like a rigorous process where you have like, oh, like you have this five dimensions and um, uh, let's say yeah, uh, Java skill, like or the Python skills, front-end skills, and then like um, how team fit, and then you have the applicants, and then everybody gets an up. So, so like a rigorous Excel sheet assessment of people. But this is actually everything. No, I mean, it looks like like science, like how do you assess people, and how do you give it dimensions, and how uh, do you then decide whom to hire? But if you like, like, uh, and it appears uh, like correct because you actually use the math formulas. So you get like on back end you get like five, on front end you get four. So yeah, you're higher, something like that. And um, the same instruments are used like in uh, physics, right? In social, this kind of social science, you use the same instruments. But there is um, actually a tendency um, to overestimate it. So if you like ask the big, big companies that hired like fifty thousand people and they um, compare the performance on the interview and then the actual job performance, there is no correlation. There is zero correlation between those two data points. And we have this data with like large sets of, of applicants. So basically recruitment is just, um, yeah, you think it's um, a proper uh, science, but it's not. That's why I'm saying it's actually worse than dating, because in dating you actually know, oh, you, you, you have like, nobody knows what's to do in the right uh, first date, or it's like really subjective, right? But in, in here, it's, um, uh, everybody thinks he has like a scientific method, but it's uh, unfortunately not the case. At least this is what we see from the reality. Um, so, um, uh, even like IQ and all those, let's say, very hard, like hard looking, um, uh, let's say, facts that are published in, in social science literature, there is some new research showing that this is basically not as rigorous as people think. And all these numbers and assessments, they basically stand on very, very not, um, uh, let's say, um, fundamental uh, grounds, unlike physics, where you really can like drop an apple and it like drops by like some speed and so on. So, with people, it's not that easy. 
So, um, but still, I'm just sad. Oh yeah, everything is random. Like there is no like interviewing is totally random. You shouldn't do. It. But of course, you that's not exactly true. There's also the aspect that practice makes you much, 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 much better. And people under, especially seniors, underestimated how much different how much difference it makes if you really practice like uh, interview questions and just tell me about yourself and tell me about a complex project that you built. If you practice this answering to your friend like three times you will get like a much better flow of like um, communication and the interviewer will say, oh, this is like a good communicator immediately, yeah. So uh, hard questions you can find on those, so you get the slides later, so you can uh, uh, look at it. I, look, I, I searched for you like front-end questions and Python questions that might be interesting for you to practice and look at. And uh, yeah, I would really, really stress this point to really invest a lot of time actually in this. Seven like things to stand out where I think oh maybe this is really even more specific where you can um, um, really make a good impression because obviously as bootcamp graduates you do have this lack of oh this person never worked in a company so you have to do this interviewing thing even more uh, uh, well let's say than other, than people with uh, like experience working in companies. So um, I made for you two links on GitHub. If you click them, you will find all like companies in Zurich that use JavaScript. So there are GitHub repositories, the same with Python. And what you can do is you can like uh, look at the GitHub profile of those companies and for instance, follow them on Twitter, interact with them already now. So to really build like build up, let's say, also online a network. Uh, Twitter uh, is uh, literally, in my opinion, the only social network where if you use it right, it has tremendous business value. If you really follow the right people, if you interact with them, um, let's say uh, if you interact with Dan Abramov, like a famous front-end uh, person, uh, if you interact with his tweets, he might answer this and he would never like reply some random person's email, but he will like reply people on Twitter. And there's no other like social network gives this ability to reach like some super famous people that have no time and actually get a response on something. So uh, this thing uh, uh, can happen there. Um, so um, also I recommend going to meetups, events, conferences, because you never know what will happen there, whom you meet, and which like uh, technology thing you will learn. EuroPython is a good one, very cheap, once a year in the summer. And uh, if you want to have something like online that you want to present, what few people do is just make a video, how you code, put it on, on Loom is the easiest tool to use, or, and Capwing, you can actually double speed it up. Because people, if they are not used to doing demonstrations, uh, they usually are too slow. So basically, if you make a video of you coding or doing something and then put it on YouTube, um, usually it's too boring. So what you can do is, uh, like, you can just speed it up and then put it there and people will, like, be actually able to consume it in a, in a nicer way. I once had a friend, um, uh, he had an accounting background, he then uh, went to a coding bootcamp. And then he got the job because the company was building accounting software. So he was actually more attractive to the employer than like experienced developers. And you all have probably some like, uh, let's say other background and uh, think how you can maybe leverage this. Overprepare, research the company you're applying to, technology stack, uh, the person you're talking to, and try then to use it in the conversation to really be like, okay, uh, like in a way super humble. Um, most of you probably will be like this anyway because you're kind of junior. But also later, like really say, for example, in an interview, hey, may I ask questions now or at the end of the interview? Or for instance, if it's like a live coding thing, then you can ask, um, uh, should I like uh, assume that the input of this function is like, is like uh, yeah, numbers or strings or to really try to really feel the other person if you're interviewing and this gets easier with practice. So and practice actually is to avoid regrets. Yeah? Because usually if you don't practice, then the situation will be like this that you're like, oh, after the uh, like, uh, interview, you remember actually the correct answer and what you have prepared, then it would have been much, much, much better. Because good interviewers, actually, they don't want like, to find your weaknesses, they won't find your strengths. Because everybody has weaknesses, even like super senior people. So um, uh, you should like, focus to really like, have a conversation. But a little bit of a funny thing that people don't understand, um, sometimes it's like, okay, you shouldn't be too bad, but you shouldn't be too good at interviewing either. So then, because then it's kind of, sometimes people might think, oh, this person invested more time in interviewing instead of actually working and coding. So he's like over-prepared in a way. 
and uh, of, or, or if you know the question, so there's a question and you immediately know the answer, and it's like, hmm, this person maybe heard this question before. So if this happens to you, just say, hey, I heard the question before. Yeah. So this honesty will give you like plus points in the process uh, later on. And if you make everything great, then of course there will be the salary negotiation um, part. And there it is um, uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, crucial because you can really, like, uh, let's say, get, uh, like, a, like, I don't know, 5,000 more, 10,000 more, 15,000 more with seniors um, if you say the right thing in a, like, two-minute conversation. So it's basically, like, the most important, in a way, monetary thing, at least. Um, and it is very unfair. I love to actually talk about this because it's the most unfair situation because managers or like business people, they negotiate with other companies, with clients, with candidates, like five times, ten times a week. And you poor candidate, you maybe do this like once in like three years maximum. And uh, it's a very unfair situation. So you should be really aware of that from the get-go that uh, you are kind of the, the untrained person here. So usually it's uh, not ideal to up, uh, discuss a compensation upfront. So normal, it's actually that the company asks for this, but you can always say how I want. I don't want to discuss like compensation now because I don't know how I will uh, like be able to benefit the company. For example, if a company uses uh, Django, like I think a framework you use right now quite a lot, then you can of course help the company much more than if they don't use it because you kind of like yeah don't have this leverage. So um. Really find out how you can add value. If you have to give a number, try maybe to give a range. You say maybe 5,000 to 7,000, and then of course 5,000 will be like exactly the number, like will be kind of maybe used against you. Uh, but actually in Switzerland, they are not that uh, like uh, super cutthroat about uh, salary negotiation usually, but some are. That's why I would actually put thought into this. And of, don't disclose your current salary. Also later in your career, it's irrelevant. I saw programmer, programmers going from yeah, uh, eight, yeah, eighty-five thousand to like one thirty uh, because they were like underpaid uh, in a very like small company, and then they get like a raise for fifty thousand. That's like could could happen. Yeah? So this makes no sense to disclose the current salary. Uh, really, only like how you can help the company and what the company is actually willing to pay. And uh, like let's say if you if you give them a number, let's say you're in a call and they I we will pay you this, yeah. And then usually it's it's uh, um, let's say a strategy that will not harm you if you just are like quiet and like kind of let it sink and yeah just react in a like calm way and not immediately say oh yeah great of course yeah I sign immediately because there is no value in that um, because you like um, um, the thing that people don't understand is that um, in this situation it's actually rational to ask for more because um, um, the candidate usually thinks oh I'm talking to this other person and why should I ask for more because it's like you know I don't want to be rude but actually um, yeah you're talking to another person but it's not like the other person's money it's like the company's money so uh, for, for you like even 5,000 more per year can like make a difference in like life quality but for the company 5,000 less they probably don't even notice it uh, because even like a small company of like, I don't know, eight to 12 employees, they still for them, like they make millions in revenue probably otherwise, yeah, yeah. So because otherwise they wouldn't have so many employees or like even like five employees. And uh, so basically for them, it's like a really small chunk of the whole like money going in and out. So for them to say, okay, yeah, 5,000 more, 10,000 more is actually not a big deal, but for you, it's a huge deal. So that's why um, in this situation, um, uh, it makes sense to really politely ask for more because, uh, well, I, I've never. So be, sometimes people are scared that the offer will be rejected, uh, re, like taken away. Yeah, but this never happened. I never saw like any, anyone, and I don't know anybody ever who asked for more, and then the company was like, "Oh no, this is very rude. We will not hire you now," <laughs> because because they invested like I don't know how many months to fund somebody, and now they're really like at the very end. It's kind of you are the powerful person. Before you kind of have to be like super humble and still you should be humble in this situation but there you have, can really like do something about like uh, yeah, uh, salary, vacation days, bonuses in this, in this order. The hardest is always like base salary usually because it's recurring cost for the company. Yep. And these are the salaries in uh, Switzerland more or less. So basically um, you see that um, 
there, there are like uh, jumps, of course. There's also intersection and like usual tenure where people stay. Um, some people like uh, never really, uh, yeah, or want to even reach like senior or lead or CTO. <coughs> but uh, kind of always the salary grows with like the, let's say, impact on the company that, that you have. You should keep this in mind and also be like trying to be in this, in this range. Different companies will, of course, um, pay different things. Uh, so um, I kind of think of the market in like this four categories of companies. And most programmers usually want to work at places where technology is a profit center. So uh, then uh, this would be like the right side of this, of this graph. So A or B companies. So uh, companies where really either there is like a product and uh, you work on this product or there are projects all the time and new clients. So this would be like a typical agency. Um, then you have like this companies like uh, where tech or IT is a cost center. So uh, insurances, banks, e-commerce, something companies um, where you could also have like uh, projects. Uh, so, so let's say every three months you get in it, yeah, so new project or a product where you work on, but technology is not the core thing there. Um, so salary wise, I cannot really say, oh, like those companies pay always more or less or are great places to work. Uh, there are exceptions, uh, I would say, but the general tendency is, of, is that if you are in, if you are the profit center, then in general, this is, tends to be like a better place um, to work and where you should like really apply <coughs> well, like with a good presentation of yourself. Uh, finally, um, I want to like point out okay how to stay actually relevant. So the, the, the following slides actually I want to really extremely stress because I think they will be also relevant like in 10 years for you. Um, so the idea is a little bit to have in your whole work life to have, have uh, maybe this barbell strategy. So what it means is that after you will get your job, um, you will basically have um, like a, a low probability of failure. This means that um, that you well um, after you get the job, in a way, you're kind of part of the family. Uh, uh, most companies they will not just fire you, but be like, okay, you do this maybe not so well, and warn you like four times or so. So you will not be, be fired, right? That quickly normally. Uh, but at the same time, there's like really you cannot, so if you work three times as much in your company, in, in any company, you will not get three times the money, right? <laughs> no boss will like, oh yeah, I'll pay you three times. It's not, the, it's, not happen, it's not happening. So that's why a good strategy is to have some like other things ongoing. So um, going, going to meet up side projects where basically the probability that this will be something is extremely low, like, but the impact of this will, would be like extremely high. Um, to, to show it in a, in a different picture, because I have three slides to this, explain this concept. <laughs> so basically, your day job is, uh, is basically where you have gains that are, that, are, that are limited. So basically, as you see here, it will not be three times if you work three times as much. Yeah? But if you're fired, the pain is theoretically unlimited. So the moment you're fired, actually, like uh, for most people, even if you have like uninsur uh, unemployment insurance and so on, still like the psych psychological pain that people go through is extremely high. So um, the probability of failure is low, but the impact is extremely high. And with like side projects or meetup or tr tr meetups or trying out some new framework or meeting new people, actually the pain uh, is very low. Uh, the impact of the pain. So basically, if you go like to I don't know one thousand meetups or like let's say or like uh, meetups, then um, uh, they are boring or you don't learn anything. Okay, great, you have like invested one hour each, so that's not so terrible. But then at some event, maybe you will uh, meet someone who like you started a company and startup together and will be like super great. Like for instance, my like uh, uh, best client that I still work with is like somebody I met on a meetup like in 2015. And still like we work together and like otherwise I would have never like reached this person ever. It was just by like this random encounter. So here like kind of the gain can be, you cannot really put a number on the gain. And uh, the, the important thing is that time. So this slide is the same concept, but in, 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 to show time. So basically uh, in, in concave, so in convex, this is like because of the functions, uh, they look like this, so basically this is why the name, where the names come, comes from, like convex and concave. Um, 
And if you put time on it, then at some point you will leave your job or be fired. So this bad event, it will happen if the time horizon is long enough. The same with like startups or like let's say this convex things in your life. Like if you go on enough dates, then at some point you will end up with a partner. Or if you like, yeah, so this is kind of the two, like people don't get this thing um, that this actually can be very impactful on your life and on your career to keep this concept in your head. So you can find the slides here on this website and also like I've written a longer, much longer thing and uh, yeah, you can get the propulsion discount on the, this uh, URL and you can ask questions if you have them now or also uh, later because last time we had actually people coming then in private because they didn't want to ask in the group. <laughs> so I'm around now, uh, yeah, feel free to ask some questions now and afterwards. Uh, yeah. Do you find that like startups pay a lot less? Uh, in Zurich. Uh, do startups pay a lot less in Zurich? Um, it depends. Um, uh, some that have a solid uh, venture venture capital, mm, no, they pay. They would pay like market rates actually. So maybe a little bit less than a financial institution, but some would actually match. Uh, so because it depends what they're looking for. If they look like for a super senior specialist, they kind of have to pay this and they can tell it to investors and then investors will like kind of make this happen because this, if it's of course a bootstrap startup so if you have like the, depending on the definition of startup if it's like really like you know three people and they have like huge investment then they would pay market rate but if it's like an agency and it's like you know small like the founders it's their money then they would kind of explain this to um, to the applicants and then they tend to pay uh, less uh, but uh, they kind of have more freedom because like the venture-backed startups they are basically really dependent on the investors they cannot like ex they're not entirely free but those startups that where the founders put their own money in they pay less but they can also tell you like okay like you can be like CTO or really have a huge impact so the other situation can be different like in, in different in this way Question. Um, so, in turn, for for example, if you have a, some experience already in coding, in programming, or something, and you get presented uh, presented for an internship, uh, how will this impact or anything or nothing in the future uh, in your in your CV? For example, like, oh, you did an internship and you didn't wait to just make a little, just be maybe more patient and get a junior position. Or something like that. Will be any impact? Is like it look bad, good, or nothing? For someone who already has experience, if you don't have experience, an internship is a blessing. But if not, I mean, what is better, to wait, not wait, or? So you mean a, some? Uh, so, so the question is basically if you have already coding experience, yes. and you and feel that you are, you can go to a junior, but there's an internship there. It would look bad or... Uh, so, so, okay, so you're a coder, you, you have already work experience, but you like the company so much or the tech stack that you kind of like go for it for the, for the, for the brand or for anything, but you have that intern on your, like, let's say, next job, yeah, yeah or a junior. I think it would be not really a difference between intern and junior. In a way, yeah, you would have, if you have, like, of course, if you have, like, uh, uh, developer, senior developer, uh, intern or junior then of course it will stand out and then you will be asked this but you can like kind of immediately also in the CV kind of highlight this why what, what what motivated you to do this and it might even be like a good in a way because good thing because kind of you don't have because most pro most people have this ego problem that they are like at some level and they cannot go down and it's like super terrible and it's like, uh, not so good actually I, I know people who went down they worked in banking dot uh, net 130 40k so extremely high salary and they went down to like 95 from 135 to 95 because they wanted to do python so so yeah uh, yeah people have different preferences and you just need to explain it in a way if if it could come up and yeah i think it's not a big deal at all what well, uh ways of that that you know of to stand out to an employer on like initial contact and has anyone done anything innovative that you can talk about? 
to stand out uh, in an application towards an employer. Uh, you just communication, not necessarily application. Uh, to uh, to interact on on um, exact things the company built. So there, there would be people who, who do this. So basically, the person saw something like a company might use Django, and then you apply like, oh, I did like for example, like the company used like some library, a Django library, and then you reach out to the author of this blog post that you use this library as well, and you liked it also, or you encountered the same terrible bugs, or you thank them for the like bug fix they provided. This could, this could work definitely uh, very well and could bypass you the problem with the 200 uh, inbox things where you're one of those. Um, and then go directly to the, to the process faster, yeah. But your question, yeah, I mean, you have to, every situation is different. So basically I could like tell like, now some stories, but uh, you, you have, the situation will be different for you. So you have to really find like a an, like an kind of your way to approach the company in a correct way or find somebody who works there, you talk to and so on. So this warm leads, they work, they work best for applicants to somehow get a warm introduction to someone. Yeah. Could you briefly explain what happens like, on the recruiter side? Because uh, in, the, in the past two weeks I activated a LinkedIn that I'm available for offers and then I've been, I've been in contact by many recruiters. Yeah. Many phone calls, nothing happened so far. Yeah. So uh, what is happening? Like when they contact, they, they talk to you on the phone and they say, okay, can I put your CV forward to this uh, uh, company? And then I say, okay. And then what, what is happening <coughs> after that? Um, there, uh, okay. So do you have, yeah. Like, yeah, I got your point. So basically the, the question is, you activated on LinkedIn that you're job searching and of course you now have like this whatever developer profile that you did some Python, did some JavaScript and after you like said oh I look for jobs now you get like a lot of calls and a lot of emails and you get in the call and they're like hey can I send your CV to this company yeah. so there could be several things uh, I would always in such a case if it's like a third party agency you should always ask do you work with this company and if yes, for how long? And actually do it on the call. Because some, like, the unfortunate reality is the following. Basically, there are like, um, basically bots like scanning the internet. Like some of them are like illegal tools that like LinkedIn actually like doesn't allow, but they still are used. And some are like LinkedIn, like the proper, what they have as like the recruiter account. And they like try to find anybody that has somewhat a developer profile that says, oh, I'm looking. And those people will be called, and that's why you have been called. And some of those uh, rec third-party recruiters, they really have like a working relationship with this client and worked with them for like many years, and they really kind of um, only send your CV to those specific companies. But some others that especially are maybe not based in Switzerland, they actually will take your CV and actually like with one click, like send this to 100 companies and tell the companies, you want to hire this guy, pay us without like your consent or anything. So the range of, let's say, what happens with your CV, it can have it, it, the quality of the, like the, you, basically your, your life can get screwed. If, so basically, so basically uh, your proper PDF CV, don't just send it around, but like really talk to the person and say, oh, like really ask questions about the company, then you will hear it, like um, if they really have an actual business relationship with this company. Because I can also start now like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm hiring for Facebook, like get me all your like profiles and then I like will front run actually to this company and then like, hey, I have this all like great developers and so on. This is what in, the reali in reality what happens. So basically your job as a job seeker is to, and thank you for this question because like, no, like, I don't know, like only like one out of 10 developers even has this like idea that something is weird there. <laughs> so basically, um, to avoid this problem with your private information, in a way, you can just, you have to just ask, do you have like a working relationship with this company? Since when? Um, and uh, do you have like a actually contract set up with them? And this would be in the call enough to like, you will hear the answer, like if there is some weird thing going on or, or not, and yeah. And 
ask another question. Um, do companies usually use recruiters for positions that are not senior? Um, <laughs> companies use recruiters for positions that are not senior. Mm, sometimes, but of course with less frequency. So uh, junior and intern, normally this is not like, w you don't use a third party recruiter that often for this. Mi Mid-level, yes, senior, yes, uh, lead, yes. But everything other than that is usually something that the company, because the, 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 the companies hire junior or, or, or um, interns uh, because they want to maybe develop them or there's not an immediate like monetary uh, like um, plus by the person, by the intern or by the junior. The person costs. For the, for, for the first year, it's like a cost. But a mid-level or senior developer, like depends on the company, like if the person gets, gets paid, like a mid-level developer gets paid 100,000, I guarantee you, in some way, the company gets like 300,000 of value out of the person. And at like the big tech companies, it's like 2 million or something. So if people are, oh yeah, Googlers are paid like 200K, actually it's not much because the Google makes like 2 million or so. So um, with smaller companies, of, it's, it's not that high, of course, so, but still it's like in this range for, uh, for yeah, mid-level developers uh, and for, for yeah, junior and interns. So there's not like, the, the company doesn't often make money, but I saw cases and uh, also I was asked sometimes like for junior profiles that it, it that does happen also because sometimes you can train the junior like kind of um, uh, in the stack rather quickly, maybe in three to six months, and then the person is really like say uh, bringing value in, and then it makes sense to like uh, pay for the recruitment, like for job boards and recruiters and uh, going to fair. But generally, juniors and interns they are hired like you know going to fairs like job fairs, university fairs, and maybe uh, to uh, somehow propulsion and so on. So so yeah. It does happen, but it's rarer. Yeah. I worked in recruitment in Sydney for a little while yeah. in account and finance, and we took like a huge chunk um, of the amount a person kind of gets paid. Uh, what's your commission like? Maybe not yours personally, but like uh, a general recruiter's commission in uh, IT. So in IT in Switzerland, like uh, for mid-level to like senior lead developers. It extremely depends. So the like salaries, like this kind of like business things in, in Zurich, uh, they are very spread. So like, if it's like a UK agency going through like somebody in Switzerland and it's like twelve, yeah. and if it's like a premium, somehow really senior engineer, German speaking, and so on, it can be twenty five percent. But also the, the the mix is different. So some are like as you say like commission only. And some recruiters work differently. They say, okay, I work per hour. Like I saw this uh, happening. So basically, okay, like I worked at no commission, just hourly work. Another model would be like the company actually pays in advance and it's also not so much on the salary. So they're like different actually models. So there's also no unified. So it really depends always like what the company kind of like wants in a way. So this rec the, the whole recruitment market, there's no standardization. It's like completely, yeah. You know, so I also toy around always with ideas and uh, the good thing about Zurich is the companies are actually open to like try uh, things out, uh, the, the companies that are not so big, um, so yeah. Okay, yeah. When, when it comes to uh, negotiating your salary, and I know that this might not apply to, to some of us, but like, before you were saying that you should always try to ask for more. Um, how how do you approach that? How how like what anchor do you use? Do you just use for do you just go for average salaries in the market, or how do you justify that you want to make more? Yeah, you have to justify it. That's the tricky part. So basically, you can, <laughs> um, yeah, you can justify it with the market, but that's actually weak because one can always say, yeah, we are like a small company, or uh, we are like not so profitable. Our departments on so it's the not so strong one. The strongest one is if I can really say, hey, like your company is doing this thing and I did exactly this. So in, in, somehow in this way. And you can always package it like this. It's like called the, the shit sandwich. So you say something nice. So basically it's like it's negotiation. 
So I'm basically you say, oh, I love your company so much because your people are really talented and really like use Django and I love Django because it's like the, the most easy framework to use. And I see that you really like uh, really uh, always um, try to be up to date with this. And I think I can really help with this because I did it like for, for 12 weeks in the bootcamp. That's why I would really prefer like 5,000 more on the base salary. And again, I really enjoyed the interview day. The experience was the best I had from all the 40 interviews that I did. So please, could you consider like raising the base salary offer by 5,000? This would be something that an uh, HR person could like feel good about to, to look at. Yeah. Are you playing companies up against each other? What do you mean? In Switzerland, like you say, oh, I love your company, I'd love to work there, but I got 90 by this company, I'm happy like come lower, but like I can't go as low as your offer. Or is that not as good a thing for you in Switzerland? So can you, what, uh, so can you basically say I have like offer from another company that is better and can you pay me more? Yes. If you pack it in this like kind of friendly way, I think it's not a big deal, you can do it, yeah. Okay. It won't offend. Yeah, no, um, uh, if you are, especially as a junior or intern, you have to be then, of course, ex maximum, uh, uh, yeah, but you can do, you can, you can say, actually, you can say everything as long as you say it in a nice way, yeah, good, then I wish you all the best, have a good rest of the day.